The session here is actually two sessions back to back, but they're absolutely interrelated. And the first conversation uh, will focus on institutional innovation. Well, the first one's called the future, we're, we're looking at the future of agency. And the first uh, section will look at two case studies which were called small problems for two reasons. One, it was meant as an irony because if you're out to transform a university, as revered as Georgetown University, or you're out to transform Singapore and its future, these are not by nature small problems. But it isn't completely ironic when you're working on these kinds of complex problems, often small things that happen create major difference, and often small things that you do begin to create a positive difference as well. So that's where that title comes from. So the first conversation will focus on institutional innovation in complex environments at the scale of the university and at the scale of the city. And I want to emphasize that we're talking about complex, not complicated. So a Ferrari is complicated. You can take it apart and you can put it back together, provided you have the right expertise it probably will run again. However, a, a weather system or a seashore, these are comp or ISIS, <laughs> these are complex environments, and there is a real distinction between them. One can be solved, the other one cannot truly be solved. So we're going to work on, we're going to look at it at the scale of the city and at the scale of the university. Both of these rely on deep understanding of authentic but evolving social relationships and their dynamics. How these then intersect with politics, economics, material ecologies, and technologies are part of that kind of com complex ecology of the problem. So Jack DeJoya will speak about his uh, redesigning the futures of Georgetown initiative and more broadly the conversation he's part of at, an, at a national level in terms of how do we authentically think about the future of the university. Um, Peter Ho will talk about Singapore and why complexity has become an important framework for understanding its past and designing its future, and why linear, to linear tools no longer work. We've been talking about a lot of tools here. And why we need new approaches and tools. The second conversation, which I'll describe here, is called the future of agency, new tools, and listening to complex, radically contingent, hyper-dense social contexts. The idea that we are now in environments where they change uh, moment by moment, and therefore what we do is very much part of contingent changing contexts. And this will be uh, Christopher McNabo and Terry Young, and John will, I will be kind of handling the first one, and John will be handling the second one. So the second conversation will focus on how new tools, specifically data mining, big data, and sense-making tools, supercharge knowledge ecologies for innovation in complex social contexts. Uh, it will begin with two demonstrative case studies of how new tools have been used, and then it will begin to move into a conversation around that. So I've introduced myself briefly. Uh, John Silly Brown I'll introduce as well. <laughs> John uh, likes to be called the Chief of Confusion. Um, that's his favorite title, but in addition to that, he's also uh, independent co-chair, Deloitte Center for the Edge. He is known as a kind of innovation guru. He was director of Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, I think that's known to you guys, uh, for about 20 years, and also chief scientist at the Xerox Corporation. He's had an uh, illustrious career, I think about eight or nine PhDs, and is uh, part of many, many different organizations. Um, and John and I have been working on a book for about six years, which is looking at new tools to begin to make tangible progress on complex problems. And so that's how we came to this. Um, I will now introduce John. I have to introduce you first. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a quick talk. <laughs> so, uh, uh, John J. DeJoya, a.k.a. Jack DeJoya, is president of Georgetown University. He's been, for over three decades, uh, in, uh, involved with Georgetown, from being an undergraduate student all the way up. I'm not going to read the entire bio. 
just to say that I think you're the longest seated president now. I think you've um, created the largest amount of value, actually, endowments you've brought to the university. The greatest change in the campus as well, new buildings as well, and is also the first uh, secular president of Georgetown. So I know Jack because I've been working with him for about uh, three years now on uh, redesigning the futures of Georgetown. I'm not, uh, wait, let me introduce Peter first, so then I'm done. <laughs> okay, and then, and then I'm done. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> It must okay. be a great talk. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce Peter, and then, and then I'm done for a while. Um, Peter is um, chairman of the Urban Redevelopment Authority in Singapore. He also has an illustrious career. I think he's held pretty much every civil servant position there is in Singapore. And again, you can read about him. For me, my, the most impressive thing is that at 28, he was asked by his first kind of mission, uh, Lee Kuan Yew asked him to build the Singapore Navy. So uh, <laughs> Peter has been involved basically building Singapore with tremendous amount of expertise for the past uh, 30 or so years. I know Peter because uh, he was interested in how design might be a really good integrative force for complex problems. And so he's brought me to Singapore a few times. We've talked about that. So I'm done, and now you can go talk. All right. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Anne. And to be with you and John, and to be on the same platform with Peter, and to follow Renu and, and Ken, it's a great honor for me to be here with all of you and offer these reflections. How does a 226-year-old institution, deeply grounded in an even older tradition, <laughs> understand its responsibilities to respond to the urgent demands of our day? It's a defining question that I know would be very familiar to many of you. How do you manage the tensions of continuity and change? Georgetown was founded in 1789. We were the first Catholic university in the United States. We've been shaped by the Jesuit tradition within the Catholic Church. We were founded before the establishment of the District of Columbia, so we were actually founded in the state of Maryland. My old, one of my old bosses used to say, it says on our seal, on the banks of the Potomac. And in describing Georgetown, he used to say, we were founded on, on, a, on a bluff overlooking the banks of the Potomac, and we've been run on the same principle ever since. <laughs> but what's important, what's important to understand is that Catholics were permitted more freedom in Maryland during, during that period. And so if you're going to have a first Catholic university, it was, going to, it was likely going to be in Maryland. And that was us in 1789. And our founder, John Carroll, in, as part of the found founding documents, stated that we were to be open to people of all religious professions. And part of what we wrestle with is how do we ensure the authenticity of a university while respecting and, 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 and um, valuing in the deepest way possible the face of the students who come and join our community. How do we sustain the strength of a tradition that continues to provide us with a sense of purpose and meaning and mission, while at the same time recognizing the need to adapt, to innovate, to create, to imagine new responses that are authentic within our tradition. This is an extraordinary moment in higher education. You heard some of that in the presentations already. How do we engage these opportunities while remaining authentic to our tradition? Well, we begin with an understanding of the very nature of a tradition. Traditions provide some of the background framework that a community can draw upon as it establishes significance for its members. This is a continuous process. A tradition is a lived experience. A tradition comes alive in the concrete practices, customs, rituals, and modes of social relationship that characterize a specific historical and, so and social context. For John Henry Newman, writing more than a century ago, about a tradition that was then more than 1,800 years old, the development of a tradition in a Catholic context invokes both the timelessness of Catholic doctrine and, in his words, the increase and expansion of the Christian creed and ritual. In a sermon offered in the early part of the 19th century on the ceremonies of the church, Newman wrote, 
Scripture tells us what to believe and what to aim at and maintain, but it does not tell us how to do it. The Bible may be said to give us the spirit of religion, but the church must provide the body in which this spirit is lodged. Religion must be realized in particular acts in order to its continuing to be alive. We've been wrestling with this question of how do we continue to be alive as we understand the work of the universities in the face of the challenges, disruptions, and extraordinary opportunities that define this moment. And we've identified two questions. What is it that we protect and what do we need to embrace to support the work of strengthening our tradition and strengthening the work of the university? As a university community, our tradition is shaped by a commitment to three elements shared by every university. A commitment to formation, inquiry, and the common good. Formation. A university provides a context for young people to engage in the work of personal formation, to come to terms with the question, what constitutes an authentic life? Inquiry. A university is a place that sustains a faculty and its students in their scholarly endeavors, a place that ensures the defining dynamic of scholarship, the ungovernable play of the inquiring mind, can be given limitless room for exploration. The common good. A university contributes to the common good, enriches the public discourse, shares what it has discovered, responds in ways appropriate to it, to the world around it. It's the idea that there is a good that we can achieve together that we could never hope to achieve alone. Formation, inquiry, common good. Three interlocking, mutually reinforcing, inextricably linked elements that have defined the idea and the reality of the university for a millennium. But the most important insight all of this takes place in the context of concrete social practices. The actual work of advancing, forging, innovating within a tradition takes place through particular acts within social practices. A crucial contribution in the development of this insight came from Alastair McIntyre and his work in the early 1980s, After Virtue, where he defines social practice as, quote, any coherent and complex form of socially established cooperative human activity through which goods internal to that form of activity are realized. We live our lives in social practices. John Seely Brown made contributions of incalculable worth with the ideas presented in the social life of information, the idea of communities of practice, Learning a practice, John and his co-author share with us, involves becoming a member of a community of practice and understanding its work and talk from the inside. Learning from this point of view is not simply a matter of acquiring information. It requires developing the disposition, demeanor, and outlook of the practitioners. And they go on to say, in becoming a member of a community of practice, an individual is developing a social identity. What people learn about then is always refracted through, refracted through who they are and what they are learning to be. We might characterize the challenge of continuity and change in higher education as John Henry Newman meets John Seely Brown. <laughs> so let me try to take this just a little bit further. Uh, this past summer, many of you would have, would have seen the first encyclical letter of Pope Francis. An encyclical is a circulating letter within the, within the Roman Catholic Church. But a year earlier, he issued an earlier, draft, an earlier document, an apostolic exhortation called The Joy of the Gospel. And in there, he, he identifies the elements that contribute to the work of the common good. I think his reflections have a profound resonance with an understanding of the responsibilities we have for one another. He writes... Let us not forget that responsible citizenship is a virtue and participation in political life is a moral obligation. Yet becoming a people, 
Becoming a people demands something more. It is an ongoing process in which every generation must take part. A slow and arduous effort calling for a desire for integration and a willingness to achieve this through the growth of a peaceful and multifaceted culture of encounter. And in this work of encounter, he identifies a crucial principle. Time is greater than space. Pope Francis writes this regarding this principle. This principle enables us to work slowly but surely without being obsessed with immediate results. It helps us patiently to endure difficult and adverse situations or inevitable changes in our plans. It invites us to accept the tension between fullness and limitation and to give a priority to time. One of the faults which we occasionally observe in socio-political activity is that spaces and power are preferred to time and processes. Pope Francis privileges processes. Giving priority to time means being concerned with initiating processes rather than possessing spaces. He writes, we need to give priority to actions which generate new processes in society. Hmm. Well, following this vocabulary and in response to those questions, what do we protect? What do we embrace? We've been initiating new processes. And these processes have a pr profound resonance with the social idea of social practices, the communities of practice that characterize our universities. We're seeking what Newman described as those particular acts in order to ensure that we continue to be alive. And in our context, it's how can we ensure that we continue to provide a place, a context for the formation of young people, for the inquiry of our community, and through our institutional agency, contribute to the common good? How can we ensure our authenticity as a university? So over the last few years, we've been engaged in a few projects, and I thought I would just describe for you three of them. The, the Red House, our, uh, some efforts rega regarding the structure of our graduate school, and some efforts we've been engaged in trying to wrestle with big data. So first, let me tell you about the Red House. If you came to our campus in Washington, we're in the neighborhood of Georgetown, and it's filled with 19th century, early 19th century townhouses. The smallest one that we have is painted red. It's right across the street from the, from the main, main part of our campus, right next to our library. And this little piece of real estate may be the most valuable piece of real estate on our campus right now, because in it, we house a project that we've been engaged in that began in the fall of 2013 called Designing the Futures. And designing the futures is our effort to question all of the assumptions about what it means to be a university. What would it be like to reinvent the very idea of the university in the 21st century? And we framed the launch around five ideas that we thought could invite new thinking from our community, especially from our faculty. We wanted to look at, the flex, at, at new kinds of structures, flexible structures, for curricular, and teach, for curriculum and teaching. We wanted to explore the, the boundaries of competency-based learning. We wanted to expand mentored research. We wanted to uh, integrate some extraordinary experiences that our students have with learning, with what happens in the classroom. Could we find ways to integrate work, work experiences, learning in new ways? And we also looked at how we might be able to combine across the breadth of the university. Could we, could we consolidate some things, perhaps create four-year BAMA, BSMS programs? And over the last two years, uh, we'll be celebrating the formal launch of this in just two weeks. Fourteen new ideas have been generated by our faculty. And they've passed the initial evaluative hurdles. And they're in different stage of development. Four are currently being reviewed by our various school-level curricular committees. I want to just share with you three, three different quick examples. An interdisciplinary course on challenges in childhood and society. 
I'm sure many of you would have experiences with developing these kinds of courses. This was important for us. It's a six credit intensive introductory course that involves faculty in psychology, oncology, and psychiatry. And they come together around an issue. The students spend five weeks in class, four weeks in a community placement, and a final period of reflection to synthesize the different kinds of learning that takes place across, across this course. A second we did this past summer, we had students working in human development projects across the globe. And we connected them globally through our Center for Social Justice. And what they did was develop an interactive digital platform to connect our Georgetown students in these different locations. It was an online eight-week experience with um, three different two-week topical modules. But what we tried to do is see if we could integrate the kinds of experiences they were having in different parts of the world, all built around a commitment to social justice. A third one, just again, an example of a studio-based course where teams of students work with our faculty to try to develop solutions to social problems. And one, one for example, that they worked on in a course on science and social change was the failure of patients to complete a medication regimen. And this was uh, the work led by one team, and they ultimately have been partnering with CVS to try to see if the insights they developed could be applied across their platform. So th these, are, these are three different examples of work that's taking place in a design studio that is questioning everything from the credit hour to the course to the major to the degree and the context in which those degrees are situated. And it's been a, a pretty exciting venture for, for our community. Let me tell you about a second effort that we're engaged in. Our graduate school, um, like many graduate schools, for, most, for all of its history, has been an administrative office. The real substance of graduate education is in the context of the departments and our schools. The graduate school kind of pulled together and integrated the pieces to ensure kind of quality assurance and uniformity in terms of, of procedures. Well, we're trying to see if we can harness the power of disciplinary strengths, which are in our departments, and their depth, but then to see if we might be able to integrate those across some of the challenges that characterize our moment. So we, we've been able to develop a couple of programs, one in global health, one in cognitive science. We're now looking at some more, more um, theme-based uh, social problems like aging, where what we're hoping we can do is create in the graduate school a context for the establishment of new interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary programs. That what is difficult to do with any, any single school, we might be able to do by, by drawing upon the strengths across the institution and, and house those within the graduate school itself. And we've got a couple of first efforts at this, um, but it's an attempt to try to uh, wrestle with a challenge that I know many of us face. Finally, let me say a word about our efforts in big data. Two years ago, we launched a new school of, of public policy at Georgetown. And when we launched it, we had three themes that we felt could characterize or perhaps even differentiate. We wanted to give it a global dimension. We wanted to ensure that it drew, drew upon more disciplines than public policy schools have traditionally drawn upon. And we also wanted to see if we could make a contribution in this new environment where, um, uh, of open source data from, our, from government agencies. In, in the context of some of Ken's remarks, one of the challenges that we wrestle with right now, it was, um, I think, also present, if those of you who were in one of the early morning sessions with Professor Cohen, and, and the challenge about the, the quality of the data that's available to us in this big data environment, well, we recognize that much of the open source movement, the, the data isn't quite in a place we can use it in a, in a very use, useful way for social science research. And so we've pulled together a, a group of colleagues where we hope we can try to address some of the challenges. By building a model around big data, we call it our Massive Data Institute, 
But the model is really one built on partnerships. We recognize that, that we as one institution are never going to be able to bring enough resources to bear on trying to address these challenges. But we've been able to uh, engage with a national lab with access to high throughput computing, some local agencies, and then some other, other organizations who are wrestling with the same kind of challenge that we are. And what we hope we can do is build a place where, where we can house these folks together and together work on the tools and, the, and, and the, the skills necessary to try to harness the power of big data, ultimately in a way that we can use it for social science research. These, these are three different concrete steps that we've tried to take in the last few years, looking at, at, at the very design of what we do, looking at the way in which we are drawing upon the strengths of all of our resources, and then looking at this new, new period that we're in where new data is going to be available to us, but it's not yet obvious how we're going to be able to harness it for, for meaningful so social science research. Let me stop there, and I look forward to engaging with the questions and, and answers, and I want to thank you for this opportunity. All yours. Okay. <laughs> As you can see, a small problem. <laughs> Well, I'm not going to talk about universities. I'm uh, listening to Jack. It sounds even more complex than running a country. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but first, let me say that uh, cities, uh, are, like universities, are very complex. And even more so, if they are like Singapore, which is not just a city, it's also a state and an island. Now, Jane Jacobs, who is, uh, I, I guess, known to many of you, uh, she explained this in complexity terms, and she put it this way. City processes in real life are too complex to be routine, too particularized for application as abstractions. They are always made up of interactions among unique combination of particulars, and there is no substitute for knowing the particulars. So as, a complex, as complex systems in a complex world, cities are susceptible to strategic surprise of the black swan variant. And the early leaders of Singapore were very aware of the uncertain and unpredictable nature of the operating environment. And our first prime minister, the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, once said, the future is not preordained, the present is not, the past is not preordained, nor is the future. There are as many unexpected problems ahead as there were in the past. So they understood that change is a driver, and from day one grappled with that big conundrum which all planners and policy makers face, which is how to plan and make policies when change is the only constant. Now, prediction, of course, is not possible. Instead, the approach must be to reduce uncertainty by discovering the range of possible futures that could emerge. And in this regard, a key process that is employed in Singapore is scenario planning that was famously developed by Shell slightly more than 40 years ago. And in Singapore, national scenarios are developed every few years, national level. And these national scenarios guide all ministries and agencies. And the process is embedded in our annual strategic planning and budget cycles. But notwithstanding the benefits of scenario planning, it's a linear process. Right. It cannot anticipate black swans and other strategic shocks and unknown unknowns, whatever you want to call them. And Singapore, uh, like many other cities and countries, experienced a lot of shocks. And in the last couple of decades, this included the Asian financial crisis of 1997-98, the uncovering of the Jamia Islamia terrorist network in 2001. That was our equivalent of 911. SARS in 2003, and of course, 
the global financial and economic crisis of 2008-2009. And so these experiences taught us that while scenario planning is necessary, it is not sufficient to fully understand the uncertain and complex operating environment. And since the mid-2000s, the Singapore government has deployed a larger suite of tools, which we call Scenario Planning Plus, to emphasize that scenario planning is still the base. And it is a toolkit that includes, in addition to scenario planning, other methods such as backcasting, wind tunneling, causal layered analysis, the Carnarfon framework, sense-making, horizon scanning, emerging strategic issues, and so on. And the aim of such capabilities is not to eliminate, but to reduce the frequency and amplitude of strategic shocks. Now, boundaries are very often used to reduce complexity, and this is achieved by drawing boundaries around smaller parts of a larger complex system in order to make things easier to manage and perhaps to understand. And it's a form of reductionism. So nations are divided into provinces, provinces into cities, cities into municipalities, and so on. <laughs> Companies are organized into departments, governments into ministries and agencies. But this approach <laughs> is often unable to address the wicked problems arising from complexity. In government, this is simply because there's no single agency that is truly equipped to deal with a wicked problem in its entirety. And this derives from the simple fact that wicked problems hardly ever fall tidily under the responsibility, let alone the capability, of one agency. So breaking through boundaries and getting agencies to work together is key to tackling the wicked problems of complexity. And in Singapore, we call this the whole of government approach. Public officers from different agencies are brought together to work collaboratively in order to discover potential solutions. But they are required to set aside the instinctive sectarian interests of the agencies and instead to work together for the common good. And in a way, this is the biggest challenge because this goes against the order of human nature. Urban planning is a classic exa example of a wicked problem. And for Singapore, this is because of the challenge of packing in requirements for housing, green space, transport, industry, commerce, while catering for national needs such as military training areas, the port, the airports, and so on, all within the confines of some 717 square kilometers, which is about half the size of London and two-thirds the size of New York. Now, Singapore's development is guided by the concept plan, which is a strategic long-term plan for the development of land and infrastructure in Singapore over the next 40 to 50 years. And the concept plan process is based on long-term scenarios. But the entire concept plan process requires close collaboration and compromise among the different economic, social, and development ministries and agencies. But it does not end there, as there are also constituencies outside government. Consultations are held with various stakeholders in the private sector, and a period is even set aside for the general public to give feedback. Our Singapore conversation, and this is a term, our Singapore conversation, was a year-long process that took place in 2012 to 2013. It involved more than 600 separate dialogue sessions. I think it was 660. Nearly 50,000 Singaporeans from all walks of life. They came in voluntarily. You know, they, they, they said, you want to join, you join. <coughs> and they took part in these 660 dialogues. The process surfaced fresh insights for government as well as for the citizens themselves, such as the desire for broader definitions of success, greater assurance about health care and retirement, and these insights would otherwise have been very difficult to obtain. Such an unprecedented extent of citizen 
or if you wish, agent participation could be described as a whole-of-nation approach. The whole-of-nation approach is, as I see it, a logical step forward from the whole-of-government approach. The citizens in Singapore today are certainly better educated. The expectations of government are much higher, and importantly, the social media has given them a voice that did not exist before. Furthermore, the wicked problems that we face today are very complex, and no government should believe that it has a monopoly of wisdom. By tapping into the wisdom of crowds through the whole of nation approach, fresh insights and new solutions are discovered while meeting the higher needs of Maslow's hierarchy, such as self actualization and transcendence. Now I turn to the design approach, which, as you know, is now not about fashion. The Singapore government is now using the design approach, which puts policy planners and policy makers into the shoes of the stakeholders, especially the citizens, to gain deeper insights into the impact of policies and plans. So by looking at issues from the perspective of end users, namely the citizen, otherwise the agent in a complex system, whether it is someone with disabilities or a mother with triplets, the government is able to design better policies than if they were just developed using the usual top-down approach. Such approaches help the government to consider fresh possibilities to imagine and to shape a different and better Singapore for the future. In imagining a different Singapore of the future, the government can take active steps towards realising it. But this also means a willingness to set aside tried and tested approaches that may have worked well in the past and accepting the risk of trying something new that may have no precedent. Also, as complexity implies, it is not always possible to use deterministic linear analysis to work out the effects and outcome of a policy input. So experimentation is an important approach, and pilot programs, prototypes, and beta versions are now often being deployed. And this approach of experimentation has been most pronounced in various urban solutions to grow future land capacity. The exploitation of underground space has seen some big experiments. These include the Singapore Armed Forces Underground Ammunition Facility, <coughs> which is built into solid granite core in the centre of Singapore, and the Jurong Underground Rock Cavern, dug out of sedimentary rock under the seabed. And this is now used for oil storage. The success of such experiments convinced the government to start the development of an underground master plan for Singapore. Singapore is now about to launch pilot programs in the use of autonomous vehicles or self-driving vehicles within a few precincts in the city. And now, if these pilots are successful, then the use of such vehicles may be expanded into the larger na national transport system, relieving road congestion getting people to their destinations faster and hopefully more safely and helping to realise the vision of a car-light Singapore. Now, the rise of complexity throws up enormous challenges. Foresight and the tools of complexity science can help governments to better deal with complexity and its challenges. But the concept of governance must also change in tandem with rising expectations and a more educated and empowered citizenry. In the best cities, I think, government to you, that means government telling you what to do, gives way to government with you. Through consultation and co-creation, the people and private sectors will be tapped as true partners of government. Governed by agency, will evolve into whole of government, which in turn will embrace the broader whole of nation approach that includes business, civil society, and the man in the street. 
and collectively, they will change the concept of governance, even if they are not part of government, traditionally defined. So the future of governance in a world of complexity lies in such systems-level coordination. Thank you. Thank you, Jack and, and Peter. So um, you can see we're, we're being a little ambitious here uh, about what we're, we're putting forward. And so I'd like to just underscore a few things that I think are critical relative to both. And then I have three questions. And I'm probably, I was going to start with the easier and go harder. I'm going to start with the hardest because yeah. if we don't get to them all. But one, I want to underscore this idea of authenticity that you talked about, Jack, relative to not just even the university, but in times of change, whether it's the city or whether it's the university, how does one begin to differentiate what constitutes uh, what you need to hold on to and what you embrace? And I think that that is such a critical part of any look in any uh, working in times of disruptive change. So I think that's wonderful. The other thing is this idea of work slowly and surely. The idea of uh, beginning to preference processes, which Peter, you this is a big thing you've brought to Singapore, prioritizing processes that now begin to bring and create partnerships between leadership at the top and the voices at the bottom, whether it's the citizen or in your case, Jack, the, the faculty are working robustly to help in the Red House to bring this about as well. So it's the, the bringing together processes as opposed to garnering space that bring these together. And then thirdly is, so the idea of making space for processes. And then the third is what was implied in both of your talks but not talked about was how does one develop agility, both of you as leaders, to adapt as the work you're doing, and this is the question I want to start with, which is the hardest. How do you adapt, how do you find the agility to adapt and change when an experiment that you do, Peter, either a, a material experiment, the underground uh, kind of city development, or around foresight, uh, or the experiments around, um, around the, which haven't fulfilled themselves yet around the curriculum and, and other things. How do you begin to find ways to adapt when what you learn from that actually teaches you more than you wanted to know? <laughs> so that's, I guess, my opening question. Well, I, I think in response to that, I'd say the key uh, is, doesn't start with the idea of uh, flexibility and adaptability. But I think it starts with the idea of leadership, because in, in these kind of situations, there must always be somebody who's prepared to make the first step. And unfortunately, it has to be the leader who does this. It's not the, the man in the street or, 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 or a mid-level official. It's got to be somebody on the top who says, this is, uh, I think, what we may need to go. And he can adopt whatever process is appropriate to that. Uh, problem, but in the end, uh, adapting to complex situations requires leading people out of their comfort zone. So that is where leadership is absolutely critical. And nobody is going to fault you if you don't uh, do anything, because some of these changes are almost glacial in pace. And then when something suddenly happens, you always say it's a black swan. You know, we all surprised. Everybody was surprised. But in fact, uh, the the test of true leadership is being able to say, well, I think the future is going to look a bit different and a little bit more uncertain than it is today. Now, are you going to follow me? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's very critical. And that's a particular type of leadership. It is not management. It is, it is, uh, it is leadership. So I see that as uh, almost uh, central to this business of how you operate effectively in a complex environment because it's transformational. Right. You have to transform all the time. Right. And it's not just once, it's all the time and getting it right most of the time. Because the moment you get it wrong too many times, people will lose faith in you. <laughs> so I think it is both a combination of leadership combined with uh, some good sense. I think a lot of judgment comes in when you're operating in a complex environment and yet having processes that give uh, people uh, some sense of assurance. You know, people Confidence. don't like to have no process. You must have process. 
So process becomes a very important part of the total mm -hmm. uh, equation. I, I would just pick up on, yeah. on the key points that Peter just made. The first is it, it's irresponsible for leadership not to provide leadership. Mm -hmm. So as long as we, we have a sense of what we think is the next step, right. it's important to do it. Mm -hmm. But I think to the second point, we, we will lose more, uh, more time and more opportunity to, um, to move forward if we fail to pay attention to the processes. I think anybody who's ever lived in a university community would know that we, we lose far more on a failure to attend to process than we do on the, on the strength of the ideas mm -hmm. that are in place. I sometimes d would describe it as part of the, the additional responsibility of leadership is to try to ensure alignment among the forces that are re really responsible for the life of that community. And in a university community, that, that can include the, the, the trustees, the board of directors, the faculty, and the, and the senior leadership. And ensuring alignment there is what is so crucial. When, when any one of those pieces out of, are out of alignment, you can describe an institution that, that you, you, you can recognize. But that alignment, and I've seen this happen with you, and I've also seen with your concerns, Peter, in Singapore, that alignment requires on leadership having a different sense of listening to the system, having uh, the capacity for empathy at all levels. And I've seen that um, with your work at Georgetown. I've also seen it, Peter, at, with your concerns in Singapore about um, how do you now create this whole of government listening to citizenry. So maybe, yeah. Jack, you want to well, take that first? I, you know, just, just a point. We, it's important to recognize that in a community like ours, um, any university community, you, you have uh, extraordinarily talented folks who, but range in age uh, from, you know, we're getting to the point where they will no longer be millennials, all the way through uh, boomers. And the perspective that people bring, you know, I can remember very early on when we were first bringing technology into the classroom, some of the veteran faculty were, were nervous, but please don't humiliate me. Mm -hmm. Please don't let mm -hmm. me be embarrassed here. Well, I think you see with some of what we're wrestling with, we have some young faculty who want to try some new things desperately. We, we put out some funds for uh, technology-enhanced learning. 200 and, more than 250 faculty applied for funds and have done more than 150 projects in the last three years. We have others who, who are very, very grounded in what they do, and what they do is still invaluable for us. And we want to protect that too. So being able to recognize that there's a spectrum of folks that constitute a community, and we want to be able to provide a framework where each of them can contribute in a way that is, is authentic to who they are. Mm -hmm. um, I think this process of consultation uh, in a traditional form of government is probably seen to be a very inefficient uh, process. I mean, a traditional form of government, the government knows best, it decides what needs to be done and uh, things get done. But I think in today's context, on the one hand because of the complexity of the problems, on the other hand because people want to be involved, right. I think it becomes uh, very critical to establish processes where on big issues people are able to uh, provide uh, inputs, there's some consultation. But you can imagine, you know, in our Singapore conversation, 50,000 odd people uh, getting involved. You know, the range and spectrum of uh, uh, views that are expressed is enormous. Mm -hmm. And in the end, you must uh, whittle it down to uh, manageable proportions. And at the end of the day, decisions have to be made. This is not about uh, reaching consensus because in, in, you can never reach consensus, but this is about a process by which people feel that they are being involved and if they are reasonable, they will understand that sometimes decisions will favour their views, sometimes right. decisions will go against their views. But it's, I think, a new type of process, it's a new form of uh, governance. And for this, the, 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 the role of the leader is not just to lead, but also to facilitate. Mm -hmm. I would say there's another skill set that is involved in in, in this kind of uh, government. The leader uh, has to uh, 
uh, move people against their nat natural instincts. Mm -hmm. Their natural instincts is just incremental improvements. Their natural instincts is to confine their work to their silos. And yet you have to get them... To, so, so I always tell my people, if you want to be a leader in this uh, kind of environment, you better have the additional skill of being able to nag. Mm -hmm. You must be a nagger. If you can't nag, forget it. Because you must always remind people, this is what needs to be done. Let me ask a yeah. little bit about our time, uh, if I may, a quick question. I mean, the problem is to lead hmm. in this highly nonlinear, contingent, complex world. Um, deep listening is great, but you also have to think about ways to potentially, going to, back to you, what you said, Jack, how do you stimulate the civic imagination? Because you know, we're moving into situations where the imagination now becomes even more important than ever because simply extrapolating even nonlinear extrapolations will not get us to what is possible. Yeah. And this is a complete new challenge for the world that, as, as Anne laid it out. And I was going to add to that because th you used the word silos. Yes. And both of you talked yeah. about the necessity for multidisciplinary working. And, and you've been talking a little bit about the whole difficulty of breaking down silos. Right. So the civic imagination, if you will, is exactly. potentially a way to get beyond yes. the siloization and getting people yeah. talking together. I, 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 I would say that, in fact, the big danger of silos is the danger of groupthink. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, by breaking down the barriers, uh, however you do it, whether by force of will or whatever, you uh, allow people to uh, gain insights which they wouldn't otherwise get. And that, I think, is where it uh, empowers people to think out of the box, to gain insights, to imagine uh, future possibilities. That is why, at different levels, this whole business of breaking down silos is so critical Yep. to dealing with a problem of complexity because that's where, and that's why it's so important, I mean, uh, Anne knows why in Singapore we take a lot of trouble, not just talking among ourselves, but talking to people outside Singapore because it's, you know, if we just talk about ourselves, it's a bit of navel gazing. So you want to talk to people outside the system who may take, have a different take. You may not necessarily agree with them, but if you've got the skill of listening, you gain insights. Right. And from insights, you get inspiration, and uh, that triggers the imagination, and from there, you innovate some, right. something. Especially if you can listen across the silos. That's right. Which, yeah. Absolutely. So, so the, the one thing I would say is um, we, we need to both respect and protect discipline mm -hmm. and disciplinary strength. We can't do interdisciplinary right. work right. unless it's grounded exactly. in this incredible, and that has been the great contribution of the modern university going back to Berlin in 1810. We, we understand that the epistemic authority mm -hmm. from a university is d derived from the strength of the disciplines. Right. But so many of the challenges that we face today come from that. <laughs> we, we need to recognize that, that we, we we, we need to be able to work those issues, right. and we need to be able to work across the disciplines in ways that will require new institutional structures. Right. And that's where we're playing, playing right now, John, in terms of our imagination. What kinds of structures will be authentic to a university and enable us to, to be true to who we are and be... Right. able to address some of these challenges. Fantastic. One thing that's not been, and then we'll move on, one thing that's not been talked about, when people talk about uh, the kind of panacea of project-based learning, right, and the idea that you can, and Tim alluded to it this morning, the idea that when you have a project, you can draw on what you need. This, this does not honor this notion of a body of knowledge, where actually knowledge does grow on top of other knowledge. And whether it's disciplinary knowledge or even interdisciplinary, bodies of knowledges, practices of practices, this is one of the things we have to really hold on to. Um, part of this deep listening, to the, and this is what you do in complex systems, is you listen deeply either as a really, really empathetic president or a really enlightened leader, but part of it also can be supplied by technologies, and that's the next kind of group we're going to have up on the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank both you. so Thank much. You. That was wonderful.